Good afternoon and welcome to our second webinar on teaching in ESL in multi-level classroom series. My name is Brenda Huey Rosas and I am the ESL specialist for Thesis International. I have a bachelor's degree in Chinese and a master's in English, teaching English to speakers of other languages, otherwise known as TESOL. I also have 10 years of experience, 10 plus years of experience, in ESL classrooms specifically focused in multi-level classrooms. Last time we talked about teaching ESL in multi-level classrooms versus maybe in a single level classroom and why you might want to choose multi-level over single level to fit your ESL program. We also talked about ESL strategies, interactive activities that promote participation for those particular classrooms. Today we are going to focus on schema building. Now, schema building is really about building, prior, uh, building background information for students when you're covering a new topic or maybe even a reading, some vocabulary, or something that has content. The idea here is to take the student's prior knowledge and then see what they actually are focusing on and try to put those two together so they are able to then understand more clearly what you're going to be teaching as new. So moving over to our slide here, we are going to look at different things, a flow of activities. So first of all, we really do believe in starting things with an essential question. The essential question connects the students to the world, to the material they're going to study about and how they relate to that material. We then can move into a video using a video that you've created or maybe something on YouTube or Vimeo or other types of videos because it draws the students in. It gets them interested and engages them in the topic that we're going to cover. We then can move into brainstorming activities. We are actually going to look at a brainstorming t-chart but you know of course there are plenty of brainstorming activities out there. Then from that brainstorming activity, we're going to talk about how we can do some different games such as walk the line and categories. That brainstorming activity then leads into a writing activity. And then after that, it leads into a speaking activity. So the idea here is through schema building, you are focusing on maybe some reading, but most importantly, listening, speaking, and writing. So the idea here is that you are focusing on many skills even before you get to the actual content of the class. All right, so let's get started. When we talk about an essential question, for example, what freedoms do we have? It should be closely related to the topic at hand. For example, the one I'm going to give you is Statue of Liberty, symbol of freedom. So the question is, what freedoms do we have? We want students to work with this question, to grapple with different things to really see how this question relates to them. So what we can do with the essential question is something called the brainstorming map, bubble map, many people know what these are. Um, and the question in the middle it says what are some freedoms you have. Now I like to do this activity with post-its. You can always do it digitally or on paper but the idea here is I like to pass out post-it notes to my students and ask them to put one item or one example of a freedom they have. So for example, students, today we're going to be talking about what are some freedoms you have. Here I have some post-it notes. I'm going to pass them out right now and I want you to think about some different freedoms you have. Now keep in mind your freedoms may not be the exact same thing as what um, other people have. If you don't understand freedoms, freedoms are some things that you feel that you can do, that you are allowed to do that maybe your parents say you can do, your country says you can do, this is freedom. So, I want you to think, write some examples, and then hand them in. So afterwards, when you as a teacher collect these sticky notes, you can then display them on a brainstorming map such as this. So here, you can see on the brainstorming map, I might have some pre-made examples here. Watch my favorite TV show. Oops. So the idea is when I grab this, I can then move it into one of the bubbles. Watch my favorite TV show. 
Watch TV whenever I want, maybe something closely related, so I can put that there. Watch any movie I want to see, again closely related, so you can see here how I'm grouping. Sleep over at my friend's house, not so related. Grow up to be anything I want to be. Dress myself in the morning. Freedom to choose the cereal I want to eat. Now that's an interesting one. We'll talk about that later. And then play video games during my free time or in my free time. The idea here is that you have created a bubble map visually for the students to see. They have now have some examples of what other people view as their freedoms and maybe they don't agree exactly. But this is just a simple intro activity. Of course, you could use this as a full-on brainstorming activity and not do it in intro activity. But the idea here is students have already written. They've listened to your instructions and now they're providing information and listening to, you know, and seeing basically some different examples about freedom. Moving on to the next piece, it is the video. Some reasons to show a video. Practicing listening comprehension. Practicing answering questions from a video. But most importantly, it's just for fun. So when we show a video, I always believe in showing the video first, just for fun. Um, students don't feel like there's any stress, zero risk taking and just listening. And then secondly, afterwards, I would then have them take notes on what they understood. Now when you do this, it's important because you can see an informal assessment quickly, instantly, on how much students are actually understanding when they're listening. If you look at their papers, you may see a range from a picture to some words in their own language to phrases, just vocabulary words, or even a complete writing paraphrased of the video they just saw. Then thirdly, I really like to do a listening question. Students are asked a question, they watch the video, and then they need to pull that information from the video and write down the question. We'll talk a little bit more about that after I show you the video. So here, I'm actually taking a video from Eloquence, which is the product I am a primary author of. But just as an example to show you what a video might look like and how it can lead to the various activities. So here's a video on the Statue of Liberty. I want to just to know that you might not be able to hear this video because of the audio, but you are able to see things and notice things as I talk about it. So here there's a narrator narrating the video. There are words popping up and the idea is they're seeing an image of the Statue of Liberty. So an image, words, as well as hearing what the Statue of Liberty is about. So again, this video is created by us, but again, you can use any type of video you want, YouTube, Vimeo, um, or you know, create your own. So I'm gonna pause it right here and go back, but the whole point for a video is again to take notes, have them tell you what they understood or see it in their writing. And then secondly, the question. Now, something interesting about when you ask students questions, you really want to give students optimal time to answer it. So by having them write the answer down, you're extending wait time for those students who may be at a lower level. The higher level students always raise their hand, they're shouting out answers, but you really want to give students ample opportunity to answer. So what happens is when you have them write it down and ask them later, to talk about this question, you're giving them that wait time. Okay, so moving back now to brainstorming activities. We are now talking about a brainstorming T-chart. The idea here is that it's just one example of a brainstorming activity. You can always do brainstorming activities in uh, T-charts, bubble maps, Venn diagrams, uh, boxes with four corners with four different questions. Um, I like to do picture collages, word collages, really anything to get them to put their ideas down on paper. Now, brainstorming activities, you would think, okay, it's an assignment, one student has to do it, they then need to turn it in, I need to give them a grade. However, I really enjoy putting students together in partners, in groups of three, having them add information onto this single T-chart. And the idea here is that students can then work together speak, listen to each other, and write. That's three skills. They are also going to have to read it later on. Four skills. You've just covered all four skills by doing one graphic organizer. Now most teachers will say, 
Great, they're done. Let's turn it in. I'll grade it later. However, I really enjoy extending the activity. So let's talk about this T-chart. The Statue of Liberty, freedoms you think you have and freedoms you feel you don't have. So for example, I put here, I can sleep in on the weekends. That's my freedom. I don't really think I can do that now, but as a student, that might be my freedom. But the idea is that some students don't feel they have that same freedom. They might have to wake up early and go to Saturday school or tutoring or go to more you know, classes, um, dance class, sports. So the idea here is that you are putting all the different freedoms you have and you might be in the same group and you may even disagree within your group, but that's great because it leads to discussion and debate. So here, students have finished the T-chart, of course, hopefully you have all these answers. The first easy activity for a teacher would be to, if you were just to stop here, the students say their answers, the teacher can then type it in or you can go over it as a group on paper, up to you. But what I like to do is extend the activity. So we're going to talk about our first activity here, walk the line. Walk the line is very interesting because it comes from using some kind of information. So you need that T-chart or graphic organizer. So the teacher will actually read out one of the examples. So for example, I can sleep in on the weekends. Students who agree with that example are going to get up out of their seats, move to a vacant seat. So they're going to move around. So for example, here in this image, you could see I pick my own cereals, what the teacher is saying. A student who agrees will say, I do, sorry, will say I do and will walk to the other side where there's a vacant seat and take that seat. Now, it doesn't have to necessarily be two sides of the classroom. It could be any uh, vacant seat. Other students who agree may also move, okay? Students who disagree will stay seated and therefore you will be able to have students walk, look around and then decide, okay, I do want to get up and move. Now I did try this activity in Singapore recently. I'm specialized in 6th through 12th grade. I actually taught 5th through 12th grade in one classroom, all different levels, crazy, crazy days. But the idea here is that I was teaching a second grade classroom. That was crazy, even crazier to me because they're so young and they had so much energy and I needed to do something with that abundant amount of energy. So I tried the brainstorming activity. I then did walk the line with them and students were able to get up, move around, but you could see that they were understanding what I was saying, one. The students who didn't would ask someone else so they could be involved and participate in this activity. So walk the line is a great activity. You can also do it in actual two lines in the classroom. So if you have two walls in a classroom, they can actually physically walk across the classroom. But most importantly, they're committing to agree to one of these statements or disagree. Okay. Now the next activity is categories. Categories actually, this idea came from the board games categories. I don't know if you know this one but there are different categories as you can see on this picture and they're asked to use a letter and then fill in different things. Now the in normal categories game can work in, a, in an ESL classroom when you're working on categorical type words maybe in lower level English but for academic purposes it's a little bit harder to use the actual game categories so I l kind of changed it and just used the rule of categories. So here's what happens. Students have that T-chart they filled out. They then turn it into the teacher, so maybe I have a stack of sheets in front of me. I then say something like, oh sorry, actually the students keep their papers. And what happens is one team member might say, okay, I get to pick cereal, my own cereal. And that is actually a unique answer. So what might happen is nobody has that answer, none of the teams, so they can't raise their hand. But if someone said something like, I can watch TV whenever I want to, students can raise their hand, and then that team would not get a point. So teams are awarded for unique answers, and obviously the goal is to have the most points, the most unique answers at the end. Now what I really love about this activity is when I went to a classroom to demo um, in a school nearby here, nearby Anaheim, um, and what happened was I walked into a classroom and there were some special ed students here and the teacher asked me, can your activities work with special ed? And I said, I don't know, let's see. 
So what happened was this student, uh, one of the special ed students in that classroom, she is unable to read um, words on a screen. She's unable to really read anything in small print. Um, so it's hard for her to write also. But she's very good at speaking and listening. But she's also learning English. So what happened was I put her on a team and she was able to give her answers verbally while someone was writing down for her. So that was their group of three. And what happened when we started to give answers, she had the most unique answers ever and she was helping her team win. And she would actually read out those answers and contribute to the game and thus feel very, very encouraged because her team actually won the, the game. So Scattergories is great to engage all learners. Okay, all right. So let's go back to the flow of activities and see where we are now. Um, just remember, we did play some games, but we do want to go from that brainstorming activity into that next activity of writing. So writing is something, obviously, you can do it on paper. Okay. So according to this image, yes, the student is writing. This is actually an informal writing activity. I really like saving the formal activities for writing at the end of the unit when students have learned information, new vocabulary, new grammar structures, new reading content that they can add to their writing. So at the pre-write or the uh, schema building phase, I really like to just have it informal. So we might pose a question, maybe it's the essential question, what freedoms do we have? Students can write about it. And then what happens is students write and then they might pass their paper along to another reader who will then read it and reply, make a comment, ask a question, then move to the next person and they'll reply or it can come back to that, that student originally and they will then read and reply. Uh, sorry, they'll read the replies and then reply again. So it becomes this interaction on paper for writing. Uh, what I really like about this is students are not editing. Sometimes when we think when we give a piece of paper to another student, oh, they're going to check my grammar, oh, they're going to check my spelling, yay. But that's really not the objective of this activity. It's really to have students interacting to read and come up with more content or just to have um, some kind of conversation on paper. Now you can also do it digitally. Um, okay. So you can also do it digitally, and what happens here is that in um, our learning management system, Blackboard, that we use, um, you can have students create a thread. So when they click create a thread, they are able to write their whole writing. This particular uh, prompt is a little bit different. It asks them to tell a story about a time they thought they had a freedom, but then they really didn't, so they got into trouble because of it. Now as a teacher, you might be a little nervous asking this question because it leads to things that they got in trouble for. Most of the time, students will share things that become funny after the fact or they don't mind sharing. Um, if they're really uncomfortable with sharing this, you can always go back to the regular essential question just to talk about freedoms. But here they're doing a narrative story writing. So you want students to actually write. So here I might put my name, Brenda, and then I will talk about my story. Um, maybe a paragraph, maybe a couple sentences, maybe three paragraphs, a whole story. But once you submit to the Blackboard itself, the idea here is that other students can see what other students wrote. Now, obviously, it's just me here. But the idea is I can uh, click on a reply or uh, uh, something I wrote earlier. And then I can reply to it as another student. And then say something like, that is so interesting. Dot, dot, dot. Maybe ask a question. And then when it submits, it'll be this chain of reading, replying, replying, replying. Now sometimes you have to tell them, I want you to read three people and reply to them. Um, and then you might have to say, I want you to reply back to them. But generally, it just kind of keeps going and becomes natural for them. What I like to do at this point as a teacher is actually sit at my desk. Now I don't just let them go. They are writing, they're reading and replying. I'm calling individual students up to my desk. They bring their technology or they look on mine, or it's a paper, it doesn't matter. But I like to give them individual feedback on their writing live, so that way they can fix it for their final project to come, and in that way maybe not make the same errors. So, 
that gives you time to work with students individually while students are working on something else. So that's what I really like about that activity because it really does keep everyone busy. All right. Now, after the writing, obviously we want students to be talking. So we want it to lead to speaking. Fluency Lines is one of my favorite speaking activities. I teach teachers to do this all the time. Um, there are a lot of different purposes for fluency lines. It's something I actually spoke about in the last webinar. Um, so the idea here is you have a line of speakers, you have a line of listeners. Um, but what happens is they bring their writing to this activity. You can do it without a writing and they could just start doing that before they write. But in this case where we have the writing, they're bringing it to the activity. Maybe they have their iPad in front of them, their Chromebook in front of them, or a laptop or even just paper with notes. The idea is they are either a speaker or a listener. So when the teacher says go, the speakers are reading their writing to the person across. Now we talked about this a little bit in multi-level uh, classrooms. It doesn't matter what the prompt is. If they're on different prompts, really doesn't matter because they're really just listening or speaking. And then we, we stop it and then the listeners become the speakers. They then share. What happens is we can then rotate the lines and then they are practicing over and over again their writing. After three rounds, maybe their paper disappears or their technology disappears and they're speaking from thoughts. We really want to lead students into impromptu speaking because that's really what is hard for them. In a classroom, they're not going to have a pre-written question or answer all the time. So students want need to just impromptu speak. They can have a real conversation with another person someday. So the idea here is fluency lines leads to impromptu speaking on content that they remember in their heads and they just keep speaking about. But ultimately the goal of fluency lines is to then prepare them for formal speaking. We want students to present to the class. We want teachers to listen. Now in fluency lines before formal speaking happens, teachers can walk around, kind of correct them, give them ideas on what to make their speaking better help them a little bit, maybe one grammar focus. The idea here is that in formal speaking, they're doing it live, it's so easy, the teacher is grading it, the students are listening, but they're not as nervous because they've just practiced it six to nine to 12 times, however many rounds of fluency lines you did do. But during formal speaking, it is really a time for the students to shine. Now, you can always do voice recording. In, in our Blackboard setup, we actually have a way for them to record their speaking. Now I encourage voice recording when you have a longer program, maybe a full semester or a full year. You can compare the auto recording for audio recording for week 1 versus week 10 versus week 20 and really see how they're improving. Um, if you do it that day, you can listen to it and really focus them in on a grammar error that they're constantly making or pronunciation error. The idea here is it gives you a little bit more time as teachers to catch those things, listen to it over and over, and give them um, more feedback. But I like doing it live. So the way I kill two birds with one stone is I have them if, have a piece of technology such as a computer here or a laptop. I set up the recording and then the student is recording as they're presenting to the class. Saves me time as a teacher in class, but also the students don't think really about the recording they're thinking more about what they're saying for the presentation. All right, and that is how we usually end with a formal speaking. The idea really is to um, get them to present. Students can be scored on their speaking, really easy, but then this prepares them for their writing project at the end and then also for maybe a formal presentation at the end of the unit. Okay, so at this point, um, we're going to see if there are um, any questions um, it looks like that nobody has answered, asked any questions, but there is um, an email address that you can um, send me some questions and they might actually turn into blog posts that we write about as the experts here in ESL, especially for multi-level classroom. So at this point, I really wanted to just thank you so much for taking time out of your busy schedules. It might be your lunchtime, it's your summer. Um, maybe admin, you're still working like us. But the idea here is thank you so much for joining us. And we really um, want, it, want to encourage you um, to uh, 
uh, focus on our looking out for our next um, emails about our next webinar, hopefully focusing on vocabulary activities because after schema building, you would really want to build vocabulary, pre-teach the vocabulary to then move on to the rest of the unit. Um, below here is my email address directly if you want to email me questions. Um, I'm here I, as a teacher mentor to many different schools and clients, so I would love to answer your questions and see how I can help you in the area of ESL, teaching multi-level classrooms, anything along those lines, schema building specifically, or an activity that you tried. I'd love to hear your success stories if you, you know, tried this right after the webinar. So thank you for joining us and have a great afternoon.